This is Homo sapiens, the world's top species, possessing capabilities unmatched by any other animal on Earth. Some animals are stronger and some have better vision, but they can't match the higher functions of the human brain, like learning capability or memory. Or can they? This footage from a research facility in Japan proves that chimpanzees possess previously unknown mental capabilities. The apes have been taught the number sequence 1 through 9. Regardless of where the numbers appear, they can press them in the correct order. But that's not what's new here. During the next test, the apes only get to observe the numbers for about a second before they're covered up. But that's enough. Seemingly without effort, they point to the correct number time and time again. Humans do considerably worse when taking the test. We cannot match the photographic memory of chimpanzees. An amazing capability, which scientists, as of yet, just cannot explain. Fewer and fewer people now believe that the human race is the crown jewel of creation. A group of scientists led by Charles Darwin brought about a completely different way to view humanity. But people still cling to the notion that we have distinct qualities which separate us from animals. Maybe it's understandable that we consider ourselves to be unique. Using our brains and our hands, we've been able to construct incredible cities, build vehicles for transportation, and create light sources to illuminate the night. If we want to find the starting point for our technology, there may be no better place than this dry rift valley in northern Tanzania. Dubai has uh, been uh, considered a unique uh, place to have uh, an unbroken sequence of the evolution of uh, our cultures. People have been coming here for millions of years and it's impossible to move around without finding traces of ancient technology. Yeah, uh, this is a very prolific area. As you can see, it is full of tools. Now, here is a tool, this is a chopper, uh, because uh, it has been flecked from this side to make uh, an edge that will be used probably for breaking bones. This is a beautiful one, and you would use this as a hammerstone, and uh, I am sure this was used as a hammerstone because you can see the battery, you know. And you would use this to detach a small flake, which you would probably use as a knife. The effectiveness of Aldaban tools is being tested halfway around the world. This deer will be carved up using a technique that's two million years old. We're trying to recreate exactly the mode that our ancestors used to make and use stone tools. So this is the dawn of human technology. This is, these are the earliest stages of technology you can see in the archaeological record. Just taking two pebbles from a river, cracking them together, and knocking off these sharp bits and pieces. 
People are always amazed. They think of stone tools as primitive, but these are some of the sharpest edges you can ever create. I'm trying to cut off the forelimb. First, I have to cut through the hair and into the flesh. This is the experimental approach in archaeology, trying to put stone tools to the test, trying to see what they're good for, and uh, butchering activity like this was probably one of the real things that set off our technological pathway. It only takes a few minutes to remove the front leg, and that says a lot about our ancestors. Well, that they were very ingenuous and very successful with their stone tools. Olduvai is an important place, and finds made here can put a face on the ancient tool makers. Knowing the stratigraphy is very, very important for an archaeologist because it shows you where you are in time. So if these artifacts are coming from those sediments, then they're contemporary with Homo habilis, Olduvai hominid 7, which is the prototype of Homo habilis. Homo habilis, or handyman, lived and died among these tools and came to symbolize what makes humans unique. It was thought that no other species could utilize objects in nature to gather food. But we now know that to be incorrect. <laughs> Since the 1960s, primatologists have observed apes in Africa using tools on an everyday basis. The particular example of tool use that I'm interested in is called nutcracking. It's probably one of the most complex forms of tool use in the wild because it involves you know, the combination of three different objects, at least, um, which have to be combined in a particular um, order, you know, you have to put the nut on top of the stone and then you have to get another stone and hit the nut with that. You can't have it in any other combination. So it's quite astonishing, I think. Look. Scientists are now exploring the use of tools among our more distant relatives. These crows are a unique species and they come from an island in the Pacific Ocean, the island of New Caledonia, and for reasons which we are trying to understand, they developed a tendency to solve all kinds of problems, but particularly extractive problems of food, using tools as opposed to working exclusively with their beaks. So the task that we're testing them with um, here is one where they've got a little bucket like this, which will have food in. And the bucket's at the bottom of this deep hole in the apparatus. So the only way that they can get this bucket out and get the food is if they use a tool. And so I'm giving them a stick, which has a small projection at one end and is nothing at the other end. And so it's a very simple question. It's simply, do the, will the crows use a stick the right way round? What is about to happen goes beyond beavers building dams or ants building anthills. Those are instinctual activities and lack the problem-solving aspects observed in these crows. No one knows exactly what is going on in the crows' brains. The deep question underlying what we're studying is whether non-human animals can form some kind of understanding of the way in which the world works, some kind of deep um, principles about it. Or an alternative approach might be that they have just learned purely through trial and error. It's apparent that their brains are far more complex than previously thought. Not only can these birds use tools, they can also construct them. Here we see Betty using a steel stick 
to get at the food in the container. When this proves impossible, she does something surprising. Spontaneously, after trying to get the bucket with a straight tool, she bent one end of it into a hook and used that to extract the bucket. astonished us and it wasn't the aim of the experiment at all. I would never have predicted that the crows would be able to fashion the hooks from scratch like that. When it was shown that the use of tools was not unique to humans, scientists turned to the use of language, which had caused supporters of Darwinism to run into problems. Darwin's theories about natural selection involved gradualization. Since all life forms share a common ancestry, different traits should appear in several species. But language seemed to be unique to Homo sapiens. With One wonders how Darwin would react to Pambanisha and the other bonobo chimpanzees at the Grape Ape Trust in Iowa. Can you tell our visitor about the last thing that's going to be in the coffee? That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're we're going to have candy in our coffee. <laughs> that's right. We're going to have candy in our coffee. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Since anthropoid apes do not have highly developed speech organs, the scientists here have used technology to establish a dialogue between our two species. Okay. Pamanisha said... Pamanisha, watch this. Make sure I say it right. We were going to have coffee. That's a surprise that has sugar in it and M&Ms. Isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> the star pupil, Kanzi, has a better grasp of English than any other non-human being. Can you find some lexigrams for me? Can you find ball? Ball. Oh. Very good. Can you find milk? Milk. Milk. Good. A lot of what they talk about is food, but they can talk about being scared, they can talk about uh, being happy, they can talk about being mad or sad, uh, whether they, they have a hurt, whether their stomach hurts, their head hurts, and they can talk about the things they want to do. Tyler said we had two choices for lunch. He was going to make pancake bread, or he could make noodles. Which one did you want? Noodles. noodles. OK, we'll tell Tyler. It is not known just how lunch. big bonobo chimpanzees' vocabularies can good. become. We know that the productive vocabulary is limited to 384 lexigrams. But their receptive uh, vocabulary, we don't know. We suspect. It is much, much larger. Can you find egg? The question is if these are actual language skills or if they are simply memorizing different words. Bill Fields thinks he knows the answer. They acquire language just like human children do. They can respond to novel circumstances. For example, Kanzi was uh, exposed to 660 novel sentences, sentences he had never heard. Like Kanzi, put the keys in the refrigerator. Kanzi, go to the refrigerator and get a Coke and give it to Rose. And he was able to okay, respond to those sentences about 75% of the time with accuracy. I believe that all bonobos, all chimpanzees, probably all primates, have some ability to acquire human-like language in some degree. All right, we've got our coffee. They want to film you getting your coffee. So you're ready to have it? Pambanisha, Kanzi, and the other chimps get their coffee in the air. Pambanisha, get yours. Are you ready for yours? All right. We've had to give up the exclusive rights to a number of different traits, which we thought were unique to our species. They all seem to lie dormant in our closest relatives. Scientists have observed behavior in anthropoid apes, which could be construed as early stages of empathy and helpfulness. And here we see planning for the future. 
the orangutan retains a tool which is useless for the moment, but which it will need to collect food an hour from now. Scientists now know that the similarities between humans and anthropoid apes are more than skin deep. So if you line up a region of the human genome and the corresponding region of the chimp genome, you can look at the changes in individual bases, A, C's, T's, and G's, and you'll find that 98.3% of them are identical. That means that we are very, very much like a chimpanzee at the molecular level. But if we share most of our mental capabilities with chimpanzees, and if the genetic differences are minimal, then how does one explain that they're unable to record their history or perform open-heart surgery? To understand that, we have to take a closer look at the actual differences between us and them. Scientists at the Stone Age Institute have taught chimpanzees to manufacture tools using our ancestors' methods. So we can actually do a comparison of skill levels between three species over two and a half million years. Modern apes, bonobos, modern humans, and the prehistoric hominids over two and a half million years ago. Here we see Kanzi demonstrating his ability to manufacture knives made out of stone. Kanzi actually has become fairly proficient in stone tool making. Uh, some people dismiss uh, what he's doing and say he's not making stone tools, but he is. Kanzi's technique may be impressive, but he still has a long way to go before he reaches even our ancestors' level. We looked at over 40 different criteria, oh. and the bonobos, they show remarkable skill. You can see they are flaking this material, but in many different aspects of their flaking, they're showing less skill than even the earliest stone tool nappers. Other species seem to lack the ability to build on existing knowledge. Chimpanzees simply do what they're taught to do. Humans are different. At some point in our early history, we acquired the ability to accumulate knowledge. We were able to transfer skills to the next generation and to add new things. At Olduvai, there are signs of technological evolution, which no other species has shown signs of. Our mental capabilities have arisen because of the characteristics of a specific organ. OK, so here you have half of a human brain. Actually, it is, it is the right hemisphere of a human brain, of a normal human brain, and here, you have a chimpanzee brain. The brains of mammals are really quite similar. They vary in size, but they share a common structure. But there are differences. Some of the more interesting differences are on the left side of the brain and have to do with language capabilities. The two uh, language areas are the Wernicke's area, which is here located, uh, it's about that big, and here in front, in the prefrontal cortex, here you have the uh, Broca's area. Studies of people with brain damage have shown that these areas are vital for language development. If you have a lesion of Broca, the people cannot speak in an articulated language, but they understand language. Whereas if you have a Wernicke's area, the people can speak uh, from a motor point of view, but they do not understand language. Broca's and Wernicke's areas have their counterparts in all primate brains. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to communicate among themselves or with us. 
Is there anything else you want to talk about? But Pambanisha's conversations with Bill are always abrupt. She does not produce long sequences of symbols. It's almost always just one symbol at a time, and it's never more than two. Often our, our dialogues are based on the kind of, they open up the question with a one plexigram utterance, and then we go through the whole yes and no determination of exactly uh, what it is they're trying to say. Because the whole issue of a subject, a verb, and an object was not something that, that we required of them. It was enough that they engaged in these one lexigram utterance. And the question is, if anthropoid apes can ever learn how to use grammar. The speech areas in their brains are not nearly as developed as ours. Uh, these regions in, in human, again, are expanded, uh, are more complex. The neuronal substrate that permit us to communicate with an, uh, a, with an articulated language and understand language are missing in a chimpanzee. But there's another decisive difference between the two primate brains. So that would be the region that you see here on top here in the chimpanzee, here in the human, the frontal lobe of the human brain is vastly expanded. Our advanced capabilities are stored in the frontal areas of the brain. Memory, judgment, emotion, and, and, and all these, these type of processes that are, that are uh, eventually uniquely human. It's the highly developed prefrontal cortex that allows us to perform a trick which separates us from animals, even at an early age. Here, children are asked to guess what's inside a matchbox. Having been shown the contents, they're asked another question. What will the next child say is inside the box? Children under the age of four have a hard time separating their knowledge from that of others. But older children have crossed a mental threshold and realise that others could have ideas that they know to be wrong. When you ask Gabriel what he thinks there is in the bag, what do you think he says then? Psychologists call this ability theory of mind and believe it to be one of the most important differences between the way chimpanzees and humans think. But there are signs that apes possess a rudimentary form of this ability. Here, food has been placed in clear view on top of one bucket, but also hidden behind another. Two chimpanzees in separate rooms are waiting for the doors to open. One is dominant within the group. The other is subordinate, and only she can see the hidden food. So the subordinate can see where is the food located, while the dominant cannot. Now, when you release the subordinate, the subordinates typically go and get the food in this situation. For the next experiment, a change is implemented. The food is made visible for the dominant ape as well, and the subordinate animal reacts differently. Then the subordinate is more hesitant. You see that subordinates go less. So they are taking into account what the dominant has seen. This shows that the subordinate ape has an understanding of what's going on in the other animal's mind. This is one of the, the parts of theory of mind, to being able to attribute perceptions or knowledge. But unlike a four-year-old, an ape can probably never fully master the theory of mind. I think one of the main differences is our ability to think about others, what others think, what others do not think, 
what others believe, what others do not believe. For a human child, theory of mind is the key to all the important social skills they will need in the future, from empathy and cooperation to competition and manipulation. But hold on, we possess incredibly advanced language skills, the ability to build on existing knowledge and a remarkable social brain. It's almost inconceivable that humans alone possess these abilities when the genetic difference is only 1.7%. Our manuals are so much alike that it takes careful reading to discover any differences. The truth is there's a lot more going on in our nuclei than previously thought. Scientists have discovered operating sequences in the DNA helix that controls our genes. A code behind the code that explains why our brain genes are more active than chimpanzees. You can think about the genome as an ocean of junk DNA with the little genes floating in it. But near each gene are special pieces of DNA that tell the gene when to come on and when to come off. These so-called transcription factors decide how often a gene will be made active and how much protein it will produce. And there's evidence that this was a major force in the differentiation of the different forms of mammals in particular. How did a blue whale become so different from a mouse or a dog? Each one has essentially the same set of genes, but they're used in very different ways. We can no longer maintain that humans are superior to all other life forms. Charles Darwin and his modern day colleagues have proven that we're not the crown jewel of creation, but rather part of an ever changing world. The early stages of empathy, tool usage and language can be found in other species, just like in us in earlier times. Due to various circumstances during the last six million years, these abilities have developed drastically in humans. It's been 150 years since Charles Darwin challenged our way of thinking with the assertion that humans share a common ancestry with apes. Despite our modern appearance, we still exhibit telltale signs of that ancestry. Wisdom teeth are a holdover from a time when we needed larger jaws to chew food. And an infant's grasp reflex is a holdover from when we lived in trees, and infants had to hold on to their mother's fur. These quirks no longer serve any practical purpose, but they do serve as a reminder of what we used to be. Throughout our evolution, we've amassed a whole range of traits which would end up being a lot more important. Scientists have focused on two of these traits in recent times, and that has changed the way we view our ancient history. By walking erect, we were able to free our hands and start changing the world. And our advanced language skills have allowed us to express our imagination and carry out impressive joint ventures. These upgrades help turn an ape into an architect. According to Darwin, we can trace our evolutionary lineage back to when we left the trees and headed out into the savannah. 
scientists are now scrambling to find the creature that rose up from all fours. The oldest impression left by a creature walking erect was found on the savannas of East Africa, largely because of a remarkable event that occurred almost four million years ago. A few days earlier, Mount Sadiman had erupted. Large amounts of volcanic ash had blanketed the surrounding plains, where a small party came walking. When the ground hardened, their footprints were preserved. They would remain hidden for 3.6 million years, until scientists came to Litoli and discovered them. Robin Crompton and his research team in Liverpool are trying to figure out just who could have made those footprints. Some people say that those footprints are made by an animal which is walking almost exactly the same way as we do. Other people say that, no, they were walking very much as an orangutan or a chimpanzee. So we, what we're trying to do is work out which of these, these possibilities is, is the most accurate. A prime suspect for the maker of those footprints is this creature, Lucy. Her species, Australopithecus afarensis, lived in this very place around the time of Mount Sadaman's eruption, and we know that they walked erect. This is what's left of the individual we call Lucy. She's an amazing specimen. This is the only specimen we have where we can accurately get the proportions of the different parts of the body. You know, she's 46% complete, which means that we can reflect um, that across. So the other half uh, gives us a, you know, an almost sort of 75% complete skeleton. But just how human-like was Lucy, really? Scientists are still debating whether she walked like an ape or like a human. A crucial body part that could answer that question is missing. No feet is a problem. We'd really like feet. Um, chimpanzee feet, gorilla feet, are like hands. They've got a big toe that sticks out sideways so they can grasp, and obviously it's very useful for climbing. We don't know whether Lucy had a big toe like that. We don't have her big toe, and we don't have the bones it inserts to, and that's key. But Robin Crompton thinks he can solve the mystery without Lucy's feet, using the footprints found at Litoli. The cameras, the six of them picking up the motion of 11 markers on my foot, which are tracking the motion of the bones underneath them. So we're trying to work out the relationships between the bone movements and the pressures that are generated and the forces that are generated to propel my walking. If the Latoli footprints were made by an ape-like creature, walking with its hips and knees bent, they should be distinctly different from prints left by humans. And when humans walk upright, we characteristically, the forces go like that, like that, a double hump pattern. Very, very diagnostic of modern human walking. But when you walk with bent hips and bent knees, rather like a chimpanzee, the forces are rather like those that you'd record from a chimpanzee. They go up, they form a plateau, and they go down. The team is starting to get an idea of just how the creatures at Latoli were walking. So far, our results would indicate that the maker of the Litoli footprints was a walking upright. We're getting that pattern. The bent hip, bent knee walking creates a different um, uh, transmission of, of pressure to, to the ground and does not seem so far to be compatible with the Litoli footprints. That conclusion is confirmed when the scientists put computers to work on a different task, using bone structure to figure out the most efficient way for Lucy to walk. So this is evolutionary robotics. This is what evolutionary robotics is all about. The big contribution is that from the fossil, we're getting an unbiased estimate of how this morphology is best able to move. The computer simulates thousands of different ways of moving the body forward. Most are evolutionary dead ends, but some pass inspection and are subject to further analysis by the software. For example, sometimes we'll find we'll get skipping locomotion out of it. So uh, the computer's able to find these, it explores these, but this isn't as efficient as walking. This is the team's best guess so far when trying to recreate Lucy's way of walking. 
I favour the, uh, the fully upright interpretation. The computer simulations show that if this animal tried to walk in a bent hip, bent knee fashion, it would be enormously energetically expensive to do so. The Lytoli footprints and the computer models demonstrate that erect walking existed on the savannas of East Africa four million years ago and that it was a lot more modern and human-like than previously thought. It also means that Lucy can't have been the first erect walking pre-human. Early signs of bipedalism must have existed in some other creature further back in time. When this man made a spectacular find in Kenya's central highlands a few years ago, a suitable candidate emerged. But it was also a source of new headaches. What Kiptalam Chiboy found proved that everyone, including Darwin, had been wrong. Here in the Tugan Hills, nature has unearthed the geological epoch known as Miocene. Somewhere around here, more than five million years ago, humans and chimpanzees are believed to have gone their separate ways. When we began to work on the Miocene, we were told by a very senior person, it's stupid, because the ancestor has to be in the Pliocene, not earlier. And what is, was interesting us is to go down in time, lower, earlier in time, to find out how the features in hominids can be expressed and how they, they actually emerged. Brigitte Sanu and Martin Pickford led an expedition in the Tugan Hills in the year 2000. Kiptalam Chiboy was the local excavation leader, and one morning he was waiting for them with something in his hands. And he brought this paper bag with his bits in it, and he has this funny smile on his, uh, on his face. And he took the bag and we looked at it and said, but it's a hominid. And it was a hominid. When Kiptalam found these, he knew immediately what it was. Yeah, his, his knowledge is very good. He's, he's worked with us for many, many years. Uh, we went to the site and immediately we found more pieces. It turned out to be a previously unknown anthropoid ape, and it was clear that it had been bipedal. The length of the neck, the, the size of the head relative to the shaft, all those features suggest to us quite strongly that, that Ororin was a biped for sure. The species was called Ororin tuganensis and dated back six million years. Thanks to the find, bipedalism had been traced back to a time when, according to genetic studies, humans and chimpanzees parted ways. But it also put a dent in Darwin's savanna theory. When we found the fossil plants, the leaves and the wood and so on, and all the fossil mammals, they all suggested that actually six million years ago the area was forested. The Tugan Hills hardly resembled the supposed arena for a transition to bipedalism. It was what we would call an evergreen dry forest. So there were always trees with leaves, green leaves on, and for nine months of the year or more, there would be fruit available. Ororin, who was fully bipedal, was living in a forested environment, not in a savanna environment. If hominids walked erect in forests as early as six million years ago, we were most likely bipedal even before we left the trees. And if that's the case, the savanna theory belongs in the wastebasket. Darwin, of course, pushed the savannah hypothesis. You have an ape from the tree coming down on the ground, walking around on, on four legs, like a chimpanzee or a gorilla or a baboon, and then subsequently standing up on two legs. What the new scenario is that the animals came down from the trees and they were already bipedal. But what conditions up in the trees could have caused us to become bipedal? Well, studies of orangutans have shown that an upright posture does make it easier to pick fruit off the tree branches. The orangutan provides a kind of an idea of how a large arboreal ape can adopt an upright position and extend its legs in a fully extended position, which is what humans do, and which was what Ororin did. 
Orarin tugenensis may have marked the beginning of the evolutionary lineage of Homo sapiens. Or maybe it was just one of several erect species in the experimental laboratory of evolution at that time. Regardless, one thing was made clear by the creature that Kiptalam Chiboy discovered in the Tugan Hills. We had started to become human long before we left the trees. It's not easy to study the origin of language, but early clues can be found in primitive African peoples, like the Hadza in Tanzania. Clicking sounds may have been part of a first spoken language. Genetic studies have shown that two of the three most ancient peoples on Earth use clicks when speaking. But when did the ability to speak emerge? Which group of ancestors were the first to talk to each other? Could it have been Homo erectus? They manufactured tools, harnessed fire and lived together as couples. Or did even Lucy and her kind utilise something we could call language? Studies involving our closest relatives today have shown that Australopithecus may have had more to say to each other than previously thought. Chimpanzees' physiology does not permit articulated speech, but they have other ways of communicating. Chimp vocalizations can actually be quite complex in that they're graded along a spectrum. They can be loud, they can be soft, they can be long, they can be short. But they don't have as many vocalizations that they do gestures. Amy Podick has spent countless hours studying chimpanzees, and she's recorded a surprising repertoire of gestures. I have found about 31 manual gestures that are used to initiate social interactions and they range from tactile gestures to arm raises to extended hand types of gestures, all kinds of gestures. One of the reasons I started this study was because I noticed all humans gesture. They gesture when they talk on the phone. They gesture even if they know the other person can't see them. So what that said to me was that gesturing is so deeply ingrained in the human communicative strategy. And that's why I began to look for evolutionary precursors in the chimps. Some scientists believe that human languages may have a gestural origin. I think it's been natural to assume that uh, language is speech and that speech evo evolved from vocal cords, but I think that's wrong. I think it's much more likely that it evolved from bodily movements, and particularly movements of the hands. Have you got a coffee for me? The gesture theory is controversial, but it's been supported by Amy Pollock's research. We now know that apes express themselves more with their hands than with their mouths. We are finding that the same gesture can be used in many different contexts and you just simply don't see that with facial expressions and vocalization. So that makes gesture a very serious candidate for uh, the earliest form of communication that took on linguistic-like properties. So their vocal calls nearly always seem to be elicited in emotional situations and are not under voluntary control. But their um, gestures are much more free, much more voluntary, much more intentional and much more dyadic, and that means that they tend to be between individuals. And most uh, language, of course, just like we are speaking now, uh, is between individuals. Could Lucy, a creature with a brain almost as small as that of a chimpanzee, have developed some kind of sign language? It's not impossible. Brain reconstructions show that Australopithecus had taken a decisive step away from apes four million years ago. If you look at something like a chimpanzee brain, 
you can see the lunate sulcus here going around like this. And you can see that relative to the size of the cortex, it's in a very anterior position. The brain's visual center is far larger in apes when compared to humans. And we now know that Lucy's visual center had started to give way to more demanding mental tasks. The primary visual striated cortex is relatively reduced and the parietal association cortex has increased. And what that suggests is that the behavioral capabilities of the Australopithecines were more advanced than what you find in apes. Australopithecus may have had rudimentary language skills and perhaps in the form of a sign language. However, we do know that Lucy did not have the power of speech. If you look at the inside of our mouths... What makes human speech organs unique is the low positioning of the larynx. This airway uh, is quite different in a human and a chimpanzee. It allows us to produce a few extra sounds, uh, vowels e, a, u, also consonants like g, k. A working speech organ provided benefits beyond those of a language made up of gestures. There was spoken language you could communicate at night. Uh, if you're speaking, your hands are freed so that you can use your hands to demonstrate things, to make tools, and all of the things that we use our hands for, and we can speak at the same time. Scientists now know that Lucy's speech organ did not resemble ours. Her larynx was positioned as high up as that of a chimpanzee, but her descendants, Homo erectus, had a larynx much better suited for speech. It had started to move down, and something significant had happened to their brains. They were twice the size of Lucy's. When you look for cerebral asymmetries, they're very, very clear on this. Um, it's showing Broca's caps in a more human-like kind of condition and it's 1.8 million years and is associated with stone tools. And I think this allows you to speculate reasonably that perhaps language is primitive, but is there by about 1.8 million years ago. The possibility of Homo erectus having acquired language skills is supported by genetic evidence. This is FOXP2. FOXP2 is a really remarkable gene in order to study the evolution of language from a genetic perspective. Because it's the first single gene that we know of that if, some, if something goes wrong with it, you have rather specific effects on speech and language. I was seeing, I was um, West Ham's college. At... We now know that a defective FOXP2 gene has a huge effect on the power of speech. I walk at working at Heathrow Airport, Tom 1. Okay. What do you do there? What are you doing? At first, scientists believe that the FOXP2 gene could explain why humans have been given the gift of speech. In humans, in the last six million years, this gene that changed almost not at all during mammalian evolution changed at two positions, which is relatively a lot. If kind of nothing happens for so millions of years, and then all of a sudden you have two amino acid changes in this, in this gene. But we now know that the gene is not unique to us. Scientists recently acquired genetic material from Neanderthals and discovered that they too had the same language gene. So we do not know exactly when this mutation arose and when this advantage occurred during human evolution. But it must have been the, because amino acid changes are also found in the Neanderthal, so it's probably before the split of humans and Neanderthals, say maybe 300 to 500,000 years ago. Presumably, Homo erectus also possessed the modern version of FOXP2, as genes that we share with the Neanderthals should have been present in our common ancestor. It is likely that erectus, what with its large brain, had crossed a language threshold. But what caused this? What had caused Homo erectus's brain to increase in size? 
The stock answer is that we'd gained access to a more protein-rich diet, meaning more nourishment for a hungry organ. Your brain consumes 20% of your daily food intake to keep it going, even though it's uh, uh, only 2% of your total body weight. But there may be more to it than just new eating habits. Scientists have introduced another theory about what caused our brain to develop, citing a correlation in primates between brain size and group size. The greater the number of individuals in the group, the greater the size of the brain needed. The way primates group, bond their social groups is by grooming. This is a very one-to-one -one activity. And the problem with that is it imposes a limitation on how many people you can get together in a group. And if you have very large groups, like we have come to have, then there isn't enough time to go around grooming everybody. So we had to have some mechanism for using the same amount of social time that primates use for grooming, but use it more efficiently so that we could reach more people. According to this gossip theory, language became our way of grooming each other. And according to Robin Dunbar, we can tell that gossiping is the primary function of language based on how we use it. We went out and we observed what people talk, listened to what people talk about in pubs as here or in railway stations. And there we found that about two-thirds of the conversation time is devoted to social things. You know, who I am, what I like, who you are, what you like. And only about one-third is devoted to all these other topics, politics, religion, the theatre, culture, sports. All these other topics take up a very, very relatively speaking, small amount of time each compared to social topics. If humans had retained the way apes maintain relations, we'd have to spend 40% of our waking time grooming each other. As we come through time, group size really doesn't change very much. Just one or two extra individuals, maybe in small numbers. Robin Dunbar claims that towards the end of the era of Homo erectus, the groups would have reached a size where traditional grooming would take up too much time. But at, at, from about one and a half million years ago, the, towards the end of the Homo erectus period, things start to increase very rapidly. And suddenly, you're adding more and more individuals. But even if Homo erectus and the Neanderthals acquired language skills, Fines suggest that their speech organs were not on a par with ours. What they would do, they have a language which would lack sounds like E and O, so uh, produce sounds like <clears throat> You'd have a sound like uh, D, N. And the words what I'm doing, I'm nasalizing slightly, and I'm not producing an E or an O and A. <laughs> Evidence suggests that proper articulated speech was introduced by modern humans here in Rift Valley. It wasn't until between 50,000 and 100,000 years ago that we started leaving behind signs of culture. In the future, we'll most likely find other genes governing language and speech, and we'll start to find differences between Neanderthals and us. Genes that might prove that it was our advanced language capabilities that allowed us to outlive all other hominids. Language is the vehicle of communication. It's a vehicle of thought. It is impossible to think of anything in which language doesn't uh, play, facilitate human activities. And Darren pointed out, as soon as you change uh, a factor, in evolution, everything else changes. In just a few years, a lot of what we've been taught about the human evolutionary journey has changed. We now know that the savannah theory is incorrect. We were bipedal before we even got there, and it didn't take long for us to start walking the way we do now. Lucy moved almost like a modern human being four million years ago. Scientists have shown that the original human language may have been a language of gestures and not of words. And 
it baffles the mind that our modern language skills may have developed as a tool to aid group cohesiveness, with members talking about themselves and gossiping about others. It's truly one of Earth's most peculiar species, mankind. They've built special wards for giving birth to their young, with advanced machines and instruments monitoring the delivery. And they seem to be onto the secrets of the very process of conception. The cervix of this female is actually too narrow to give birth to a child, and the sperm of the male are too few and too slow to produce offspring. Nevertheless, they're about to become parents of a fine, healthy young boy called Adam. After six million years of evolution, the inventiveness of mankind has secured the reproduction of the species. And round the corner are new technologies that may affect their evolutionary progress even more radically. The world into which Adam is born is very different from all previous ones. Only a few generations ago, human living conditions were completely different. OK, well, here's a summary of what really used to go on. The beloved Anne, the beloved daughter of James and Anne Abbey, they died the 4th of October, 1866, aged 16 years. Let's find somebody else, OK. Here we have... Uh, Thomas Smith died aged 19, and then we have young William Smith died aged 15 months. Many of the tombstones here at St Pancras Cemetery in London have one common denominator. The people underneath them died very young. This graveyard, like any ancient graveyard, is a textbook of life and death. It's how life and death used to be. And you can put figures on those processes by going to the gravestones and just seeing how long do people live. And if you go around this uh, cemetery, you find that people died young. Even a hundred years ago, about uh, one British baby in two died before they were 21 years old. So the ancient pattern of life and death was you were born and the chances are you wouldn't survive. Today, living conditions in the developed world are completely different we seem to have reached a point where our inventiveness can keep everyone alive. Well, now the figures are entirely different. If you look at the patterns of life and death for a newborn English child, born in the hospital just a few hundred metres from here, if it lasts for a month, and the first month can be difficult, it's got a 99.5% chance of lasting to 21. And that's a revolution in human life. It's actually also a revolution in human evolution. But what impact does this have on evolution? How is the human species affected by the fact that everyone is able to survive, to reproduce, and to pass on their genes? Well, Darwin's theory really turned on differences in the ability to have sex, to reproduce, to pass on genes. And to have sex, it's kind of helpful to be alive, right? So an awful lot of the children who died here young just never got to the age when they were going to have sexual reproduction and pass on their genes. So many of those deaths, so tragic though they were, were the raw material for the Darwinian machine. Now, because everybody stays alive effectively, then there's no fuel for natural selection. So natural selection, the engine of the Darwinian locomotive, has really died. It stopped. But that statement may not be entirely correct. Geneticist Bruce Lahn made a discovery the other year that attracted much attention. 
our genome seems to be still undergoing spectacular changes. Well, we have found a few brain development genes. Uh, they are a signature of very recent selection. That uh, recent selection obviously indicates that it is possible that the human species, and specifically the human brain, might still be acquiring uh, new properties. To understand Bruce Lahn's discovery, we'll have to rewind the tape a bit to the birth of mankind. Fossils show that our species came about around 200,000 years ago, somewhere in the Rift Valley in East Africa. DNA analyses of various ethnic groups have shown that this was our original home. All of us alive today are the leaves out of the very tips of this tree or bush. And we trace back into ever deeper branches on the tree until we get back to the deepest split in the tree right above the root. And uh, that occurs in Africa. About 50,000 years ago, a man was born here in East Africa. Scientists call him M168, and his offspring started to spread out all over the world. He lived probably somewhere in eastern Africa, possibly along the Rift Valley in Ethiopia or Kenya or Tanzania, and he lived probably 50 to 60,000 years ago. And he was the immediate ancestor of the first people to begin those tenuous movements out of Africa. In a few thousand years, human beings from East Africa populated large parts of Asia and Australia. And just how the colonization of the planet occurred can be traced through the migration of the ones that came after M168. These are M9 individuals coming up into Central Asia 40,000 years ago, around 35 to 40,000 years ago, very soon after that. Um, M45 appears, which is the uniting marker for both the Native Americans and the Europeans, occurred in Central Asia. And the ones who turned west and headed into Europe um, gave rise to M173 en route, probably around 35,000 years ago. And they are the ancestors of most Western Europeans today. Well, certainly, um, as, as humans sort of spread out of Africa and around the globe, there were a whole bunch of, of new kinds of challenges that hadn't been uh, faced before. Um, so in particular, going into much colder climates and trying to deal with new kinds of food sources. Jonathan Pritchard has made the most exhaustive study of the contemporary evolution of mankind. He's made a detailed genetic study of 209 individuals from all over the world looking for genes that have changed since we left Africa. Well, I think that one of the interesting things that's come out is that there are a number of examples of genes that have um, shown fairly dramatic evolution over that time span. Compared to other primates, human beings are considered to be very similar under the skin. But the study suggests that since the exodus out of Africa, we have undergone an unprecedented period of genetic changes. Mutations have affected our body hair, our pigmentation, our skeleton, our immune system, and our metabolism. Recording? Yeah. Setting but nobody was quite prepared yeah. for the controversial discovery made in this laboratory. So here we're setting up a PCR. In this case, the name of the gene is ASPM. We know that it's related to brain development because in people who have mutations in this gene that cause a loss of function of the gene, uh, the uh, brain of the individual would develop very abnormally. Bruce Lahn and his team have found that certain genes controlling brain development are under strong evolutionary pressure. They are changing as we speak. Uh, what surprised us uh, is that the G form, uh, based on analysis of a large number of individuals, uh, appears to be very young. It's uh, only about uh, a few thousand years old. So in other words, a few thousand years ago, everybody uh, on this planet had the A variant. And then one person, by random mutation, acquired the G variant from a single copy to a frequency of about 20-30% uh, worldwide and approaching 50% in uh, specific populations. The discovery is a nightmare for those who believe our brains are biologically identical. 
It shows that the new variants of the gene are not found in all of us. This particular variant uh, in SPM that we believe has been the subject of strong positive selection is more prevalent in uh, the Caucasian population and less so in East Asians and Africans and also the New World. However, the new variants of ASPM don't seem to make their bearers smarter. Their IQ tests are not above average. But the new ASPM gene should have entailed some kind of advantage. Scientists have found that they're a result of selection, not of what is known as genetic drift. Evolution proceeds sort of like a boat on an ocean of DNA. Since the gene pool is constantly affected by random mutations, no species is ever stationary. A certain type of gene can prevail within a population, not because it entails any specific advantage, but simply because its bearers, for various reasons, are more fertile than others. This random type of evolution is called genetic drift and makes the gene boat move forward, albeit not toward any specific goal. But mutations can also spread because of the survival advantage that they entail. This is called selection and can be symbolized by raising a sail that makes the gene boat move in a certain direction. And geneticists have learned to separate the two types of evolution. When there's very strong selection on a, um, on a new genetic form, then the selection drives the new variant through the population. And so from evolutionary theory, we know what that signature looks like. And so we can scan across the genome and look for parts of the genome that show that. Bruce Lahn thinks we'll have to be prepared to find more discrepancies in important genes among the people of this planet due to selective processes. From an evolutionary point of view, that's how evolution occurs. Evolution doesn't occur equally. Evolution is not egalitarian. We will find a lot of genes in the human genome that are subject to recent selection. And out of those genes, I suspect that uh, a fair number of them would be related to uh, brain function. The genetic differences between us may be leveled out in the future. Of all possible evolutionary scenarios, one is more likely than all the others. One of the things I like about living in London, which is now the most international city in the world, is that actually we are a microcosm of what human evolution is going to be like. And what's interesting is to see among young people that the he what I like to call the healing power of lust. In other words, they have sex with each other. Um, it doesn't really matter what their skin colors are. It doesn't really matter where they come from. It's evolution towards an average. It's not an evolution towards difference, which is what it always used to be. Well, the effect is we're all becoming more like Tiger Woods. Um, we're all, uh, Tiger Woods, the golfer, describes himself as Cablin Asian because he's Caucasian, black, and Asian. He has ancestors from all over the world. Um, so that is the, the new world we're creating. But there are also indications of a diametrically opposite future scenario. New reproductive techniques might increase the genetic gap between us. This is backstage. <laughs> You can walk down this way. Watch your steps, please. This is Yuri Velinsky. He's the head of a fertility clinic that's at the vanguard of a technique that may, in the future, change the path of evolution. We are one of pioneering centers in the world who perform pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for more than 170 different disorders, more than 200 different mutations. So by now, we did and more than 1,000 baby born free of disease. You can see this here. This is the babies. People come to the Reproductive Genetic Institute to get help with having children. But it's no ordinary artificial insemination clinic. The children born here have all been genetically screened to avoid 
hereditary diseases. We're looking for mutant genes, for mutant or some abnormal, if it's embryonic normal or abnormal. But before we do this, we do biopsy, and I will show you where we do biopsy. The embryos are screened for hundreds of hereditary diseases. Those with defective genes are filtered out, while the healthy ones eventually become children. We select embryo for any genetic disease that can be diagnosed in a single cell. The clinic screens for an ever-increasing number of diseases. Oh yes, it is growing least. It's progressively increasing 30% every year. Because of the genome project, it's, now it's about 6,000 different diseases related to, to molecular abnormality. Vilinsky is used to being on the news. He's used his PGD technique to perform a number of ethically controversial embryo screenings. Little Adam Nash was picked to donate stem cells to his long-suffering older sister, Molly. Vilinsky has also produced children who are free from diseases that develop late in life, such as Alzheimer's. Maybe in the future, things what you're asking will not be so questionable, because people want to be healthier. If you can enhance, enhance health of the people by doing something, why not? It's unlikely that this technique will ever be available for everyone on this planet. But in the richest countries, it may become commonplace for parents to be to have some sort of genetic counselling to ensure the quality of their offspring. And during the screening process to find the optimal embryo, desirable characteristics may be added. Some people around us are evolutionary top models, individuals with genetic profiles that enable them to accomplish extraordinary things. These characteristics might be attractive to acquire for oneself or one's children, once the genes involved have been localised. This is Dean Konazes, out on his daily run. A usual day of work for me is I get up about uh, four in the morning and I like to run 20 to 30 kilometers uh, early in the morning. And then I like to go for maybe a shorter, faster run in the afternoon, uh, maybe 10 to 15 kilometers of what you call speed work to improve my speed. I love to run, I love adventure, and I just said, I'm gonna make a living doing this somehow. A couple of years ago, aged 43, he did something that even the most stubborn endurance athletes considered humanly impossible. I ran 50 marathons in every US state in 50 straight days. So a marathon per day, per state. And I just took it one day at a time. And surprisingly, my body actually got stronger over the course of 50 days. The final marathon, which was the New York City Marathon, uh, was my strongest or my fastest marathon, which I ran in uh, three hours and 30 seconds. So after 49 marathons, I turned in my fastest, strongest time. And this is German Rudiger Gamm, who discovered that he had a unique ability for mental calculation. 7,312 mal 4,219. 30,849,000. 328. Most of the friends were frightened of this ability because it was something that is not normal. I can see them, I can memorize them, I see them as a line of numbers in front of, uh, of my eyes and then I can read these numbers. If I do higher numbers, I put them together. Uh, from parts of numbers, and then I also can read them. 94 hoch 19. 30 sextillionen, 862 quintillionen, 366 quintillionen, 77 quadrillionen, 815 quadrillionen, 87 trillionen, 592 trillionen, 879 billionen, 16 billionen, 454 milliarden, 695 millionen, 419.904. 
Of course, daily training alone is not the only explanation for these two men's capabilities. Something in their genes makes them extraordinarily fit for mental calculation or endurance sports. There's nobody in my family without special abilities. My father also was a good uh, calculator. I would say I do have a good predisposition. Both my parents are very, very fit. My dad is a marathon runner. Uh, my mom, is, uh, she's got tremendous endurance, even though she's in her mid-60s. They say one of the best things you can do as a long-distance runner is uh, choose your parents well. <laughs> Genetic research is at an explosive stage, and it's probably only a matter of time before the genes behind these super characteristics are localized. The genes controlling the brain are plentiful, and it will take a long time to make a survey of them all. But the genetic code behind Dean Kanaz's running ability will probably be easier to break. A laboratory in San Diego is already well on the way. So the running test is actually very similar to the way you would, you would do it with a human. We, we keep this treadmill going continuously. It's not stop until the animals become physically exhausted. An average mouse can run on the treadmill for an hour and a half. But this is no ordinary mouse. She's been genetically modified for increased endurance with stunning results. Our experiences with the engineered mice, they'll be able to keep running for at least another hour after the normal mice have exhausted themselves. The engineered mice just keep going. And the unexpected answer is that, that we can assign this to one single change by altering one single gene. The gene normally acts as an on-off switch. And what we did is we just left it in the on position. Increased stamina is not the only advantage of the marathon mice. They're also considerably healthier than an average mouse, and they seem incapable of gaining weight. These mice do not gain weight. They're resistant to weight gain, even though they eat the same amount of food. The gene is called PPAR Delta, and it has a human equivalent. We believe that we can extend these ideas to humans, and we're very, uh, very, hopeful that that is going to be possible. The molecular knowledge of human abilities will increase. And some people find it inevitable that this knowledge be converted into tools to propel our evolution, to further upgrade Homo sapiens. We're the species that goes beyond our limitations. We didn't stay on the ground, we didn't stay on the planet. Intuitively, people think progress is linear, but actually what we're now realizing is that the speed of change itself is getting faster and faster. Go out a few more decades, changes are going to be happening so quickly that we're actually going to have to upgrade who we are by merging with our technology in order to keep up with it. This was my first major project. I would uh, scan it, recognize the print, and then speak it out loud. Ray Kurzweil is an inventor and entrepreneur, but it is as an oracle that he's gained his reputation, making him one of the world's most sought-after lecturers. If something is an information technology, it doubles in power every year. Now, we've seen that routinely with our computers, but it's also applicable not just to electronic devices. We see the same kind of exponential progression in every aspect of biology, our modeling proteins. And our ability to simulate the human brain is growing exponentially. So we're now at the point where we can actually understand, model, and simulate our own biology and reprogram it just the way we reprogram our computers. And that's going to go into high gear very soon. We can recreate all the organs of our bodies, including our brains, using much more durable uh, materials that are far more capable. We will have millions, ultimately billions, of blood cell-sized nanorobots in our bloodstream, keeping us healthy from inside, also going inside our brains, interacting with our biological neurons, and putting our brains directly on the Internet, allowing brain-to-brain -brain communication, expanding our memories, our pattern recognition, our cognitive faculties. And we will be a hybrid 
of biological and non-biological intelligence by the 2030s. Ray Kurzweil depicts human evolution more drastically than anyone. But many people actually consider him trustworthy because of his previous predictions. Well, I have a track record at this point that's pretty accurate. The Age of Intelligent Machines was written 20 years ago. It has hundreds of predictions about the 1990s and 2000s, uh, which have tracked quite accurately. Look at the power of the internet. There's a $2 trillion economy in the internet. If it were a nation, it'd be one of the largest in the world. And a lot of these predictions were quite controversial when I made them. Now they might seem not so radical today because these technologies exist, but back then they were controversial. The new prophecy from this oracle is that Homo sapiens will gradually replace mortal biology with technology, the end result being a computerized existence. The nanobots would go through the brain, through the capillaries, collect all the details, and then we'd be able to actually recreate all the salient details of your brain. So we'll be able to reproduce the, the essence of our personality in a machine. So if you talk about human evolution, really changing who we are, uh, genetic evolution is really insignificant. We're going to change who we are by really designing uh, human beings version 2.0 and, and merging with that technology and becoming um, machine-like. And uh, that's the future of human evolution. It has been a truly turbulent journey. It started somewhere in Africa. An ape climbed down from the tree and started adapting to new environments. Changes were slow. It took six million years of genetic mutations before the ape turned into a human being. Homo sapiens is separated from the rest of Earth's species in one crucial aspect. It's the only species capable of controlling evolution. And it's hard to see individuals in the future resisting genetic screening to secure the quality of their offspring. Maybe they just need one generation to create a new kind of super breed. And thanks to their technology, they might find ways to live forever. Nobody knows how Homo sapiens' evolutionary journey continues from here. Countless possibilities, challenges and pitfalls along the way await Adam and all other human beings who are being born right now.